Give a big round of applause for Mr. Bob Holman to give you a lecture. Thank you for having us here and thank you for Bob for coming. Bob Holman. Thank you, Saeed. Yanapot. Okay, greetings, poets, slammers, perf pose, spoken word artists, word slingers, rappers, MCs, poet singer songwriters, poetry theaterians, and of course, my favorite category, none of the above. <laughs> or do I mean all of the below? Because Today's topic is the oral tradition, and what I got to say is I hope that we all think that these titles that I just shouted out here are a continuation of what the oral tradition is, that we are all speakers of the word who understand that uh, meaning is nested in sound. For 50,000 years, human beings managed to get along just fine without writing. Writing came along when? Uh, 700 BC, if you're talking about uh, when Homer wrote uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, except for one thing, of course. Homer didn't write the Iliad and the Odyssey. He or she or they, because there are people who think that uh, Homer was the name of a, of, of a job and being a poet is a job. Homer was the word for the master carpenter in Greece. The carpenter who took the four parts of the cyclos, of the cycle, and carved them together into the wheel into the full cycle. And uh, so the same way that Homer went from town to town, heard the stories, put them together to form what we call the Homeric cycle. So maybe it was a job title. Maybe it was a woman. Or, But the question is, if, if Homer didn't write the Iliad and the Odyssey, who did? And that we don't know. Because what we're interested in is not necessarily the person who said, excuse me, Mr., Ms., or they, Homer, uh, could you slow down? Because we've just invented writing, and i got to get this all down. I don't know how to spell the words correctly. Um, the oral tradition lives on in the power of the voice. And as uh, Mwende said to me earlier today, it's not a question of bringing back the oral tradition, which exists just fine, thank you very much, in so many parts of the world. It's a question of our re remembering, reviving the fact that poetry, what I call poetry, you can call it whatever you want, um, is the musicality of sound is to hear with the whole body. The whole body is your ear in the oral tradition. In 700, writing was invented. I call that second consciousness, okay? Writing, text, literacy. And from 700 to uh, uh, AD, I mean BC, to 1400 AD, writing existed solely as handwriting, sometimes with potato blocks or clay blocks, but the printing press came along in 1400, 1450, okay? So that gave us 2,000 years, and that's all that uh, writing has been with us is 2,000 years or so, um, 2,000 years of figuring out how to use the technology of writing. Third consciousness, what I call digital. You can call it digital. We know what I mean by digital, but I'm telling you this much, it ain't digital. Whatever it is going to become has not been named yet. So all you poets out there, get busy and name this shit, you know? Um, third consciousness has been with us less than 100 years, and now everybody's got a smartphone. 
the kind of technology that took 2,000 years with writing. And don't forget, the Greeks and other people thought that writing was going to rot the brain. Writing was not, they were, they were so in favor of remembering the words and figuring that that was part of what the mind had to do to communicate that they thought this new invention of writing was anti-thought, anti-creativity. Who would need to write it down when you can just stand up there and, and isn't that part of the art, they thought. Well, we're going through the same situation right now, except for only one thing. It didn't take us 2,000 years. The mind actually evolved f f to understand writing. What was writing like back then? Well, for one thing, there weren't any words. There was only meaning. There was the flow of the words. So when writing started, there were no spaces between things because when you talk, you don't start a new sound with a space in between, you just talk. Writing, when it was invented, had no space between words, and some of the languages that were being written down were what they call baustrophedonic. Anybody know that one? It's one of my favorites. Baustrophedonic means as the plow follows the ox. <laughs> Vice versa. Yeah, the plow follows the ox, that's it. You get to the end of the, of, the, of the field, and it turns around and comes back this way. And you get to the end of the field, and it turns around. And so with writing began, you go this way, and then you would read, the language would, letters would be backwards, and you'd read right to left, and then left to right. And when you think about it, all the time that you waste picking up your eyes and moving it back to the beginning of the line, why do we do that? And I'll tell you why we do that. Because there is something linear about text. Whether it is uh, whatever language you choose, whether it is left to right English or right to left Hebrew or whether it's top to bottom Chinese, it's linear and you lift your eyes to do it. Spoken language is not linear. What is digital language? I like to think maybe digital is a synthesis of, of uh, orality and literacy. Um, I don't know what it is, but you know, you know, we do now, are, we're able to have the uh, poet appear on your screen without having to be transferred into text. You know, with, with text, your voice went further out there. It could go to places where the body didn't go, right? With, uh, with the screen, you get to actually see the poet and hear the poet. And of course, what does writing become with, uh, with digital? You know, and, um, I don't know what, what uh, texting is. It's, you know, I know it took the, it's taking the place of phone calls, for example. There used to be these things called phone calls. And uh, now all you have to do is just text. And the words that you text, they don't have to be words either. They can be what, there used to be this thing called punctuation. And they slowly, that, it, slowly over a couple of years, evolved into uh, emoji, emoticons and emojis. Remember when, uh, when uh, happy face was a, a colon and a, and a, and a parenthesis? Or uh, a wink was a semicolon and a, and a parenthesis? Now we don't have to worry because we get the actual happy winky face going on there. And of course spelling is just like it was before when, you know, when Shakespeare was writing. Spelling is now anything that you want it to be in, in, the, in the tweets. I have no, you know, this, problems? I no problema. You know, this is uh, not the, uh, um, you know, I'm not anti-book and I'm not anti-digital, but boy, oh boy, am I pro-poetry. You know, and for me, uh, one of the things that uh, the oral tradition has led me to is the fact that Language itself is what we're talking about. And I want to give a, 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 a big thank you to Hungarian Bob for, the, uh, for his workshop, word shop, shock trop 
up here because I think his approach towards what education is, the absurdity of it, linking it with the absurdity of what slam is when you talk about reducing a poem to a number, um, is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about talking. You know, when, there's, when communication is, is, the, uh, is the essence of it. And language is the essence of humanity and poetry is the essence of language. I'm trying to say some things here that maybe we can agree on because I know we are here this marvelous community of people who disagree with each other all the time. That's, that's what the, the, the name of it is, you know? But for me, language is what we are talk, using to talk about talking about about, you know? So, uh, the, the thing about what I realized when I began to spend time in oral, in the oral tradition, when I met the griots of West Africa um, and realized that this oral tradition goes back thousands of years and is still as active and, 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 uh, and positive and life-affirming as anything I've ever seen, problem being that these languages which have lasted thousands of years, many of them now are dying. And whether that's because of, of, of the genocide that's going on with the cultures or because of the change in consciousness with digital, I don't know, but this is the fact that of, of the 6,500 languages on the planet, half are gonna disappear this century, which is leading me to the point where I have to say, Bob, isn't it time for a poem? Okay, so the poem that I got here is, of course, a film. And it is a, uh, a poem in, uh, that has lines from poets around the world, and they have been collected into this, uh, into this film that we're gonna watch now, which, which I hope has all three consciousnesses in it. The languages that you hear are gonna be primarily from oral cultures. Of these 6,500 languages in the world, only 10% of them are actually written down. So how have these languages survived? They've survived because the speakers of them fill in the blank. By the way, your assignment is to, is to write a poem about how language began, what was the first word, and how poetry fits into it all. I'll collect that at the end of the workshop. Word shop. Um, if you want, while you're watching this poem, to take notes, you're welcome to do so. You can use second consciousness. Uh, write down the name of the poet you like the best, or the line that you don't understand, or the line that you love. And afterwards, we can uh, talk about it. I think that's about it for my introductory remarks. So, um, Bali, if you want, we can start the, uh, start the poem that is a movie that is these speakers. Can we turn the lights off, please? And get the popcorn out.
Namuwi rui, namuwi tapatawi ponan, wanyo namuwi tungara tumbi walan ngayambun. Fonua kakai anga fetu utaki. Mai cuma nangi ewa ilan kasuruan, apo ni mema intana. Mapia ipat tolei tawe ta ilingi, kun nasi menggeramamu kami. Ada nustal tau merham lek tebukat tolo ni resu. And a nice round of applause, please, for Bala, who managed to figure out how to get the uh, the download to work in this space. So that was super. So, um, call, open call here for, uh, for discussion and questions. Anybody pick one, a favorite line or poet? Oh my God in Manchu, yes. What, was, what is my washing tub? Does anybody remember? The river is my washing tub. The mountain is my screen. Yeah, Manchu is a, a language that used to be the national language of China, as Mandarin is now. Um, now it's spoken by fewer than 700 people. But, uh, and most of them are academicians. It's really not used uh, by a, like a native population anymore. So uh, um, the professor poet there, that is a beautiful line, contemporary line in one of the most ancient uh, languages of China. You know, you ask somebody from China what they speak, everybody's going to say they speak Chinese. Thing is, there's almost a thousand different Chinese languages. And there was uh, another one uh, up here. Actually, there was one from Taiwan and another one from China. Did you recognize that one, anybody? It's called Uyghur or Uyghur which is the language of uh, people in the northwestern part of, uh, of China that is uh, across, it's a Uralic language that some people say that of, of Hungarian also. It's, it's got a Turkic element, um, but it is in northwestern China and can be written in Chinese, in Cyrillic, because it's right next to Russian, and also in Arabic, as, as the translation was here from, from Turkey. And it is a language that is very much right now uh, threatened by the Chinese, by the Han Chinese uh, government. Uyghurs are being tossed into jail for speaking their language. So it is a language that really deserves some attention. And the other language was Tsu, T-S-O-U, which is a language from the highlands in Taiwan. There are 12 different languages from the, uh, in, the, in the mountains of Taiwan. None of them are related to Chinese. These are indigenous languages prior to the invasion of the Chinese there. There's a, a, the languages of the Pacific, 90% um, of them began in the highlands of Taiwan. So that's really one of the spots where you see a, a, a language group that managed to not only hang on to its language, 
but also was a seafaring language, spread itself out, and through the language you learn the pre, what they call the prehistory of the world because you can see the roots of the language going all the way back. Now it's kind of a theme park up there, kind of a Disneyfication as if the rest of the world weren't. But that's one of the saddest spots where you find that, uh, where you find that happening. So how about the, the, the oral tradition? Okay, that's the 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 Bully language, uh, yeah, and you know, in Cameroon, I believe. Um, the, this is a gorgeous line, isn't it? The latter gave the roof its name as a way of speaking of uh, of your ancestors. But it's always me thinking that I mean, I mean, what 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 uh, God? Or who gave God's name? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but there's, you know, there is a question of, you know, you know that uh, great, great Bradbury story, the nine million names of God, that there are monks who are uh, cataloging the names of God, and when they get to the last one, do you remember what happens at the end of the story? The stars start going out one by one, yeah. As good an ending as any. So God is just a tree that I recognize there are not languages in Central Europe or Eastern Europe, which I feel ashamed because you know that. There are many, many languages, and uh, there are. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm. You know, there. I'm, I'm embarrassed that uh, that there's not. We just, it's, 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 it's difficult. You know, there are. What are some of the minority languages here in Hungary? Oh, sure, there are. What well, somebody was telling me about it uh, just today, Serac. What were you speaking? Well, you know the difference between a language and a dialect. I love this definition, as you can tell. Um, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, Carilion, you know, it's is from, uh, you know, it's from, you know, uh, uh, Western Russia, and related to Finnish and Estonian, Estonian. you know. There was some, I think, I think it was the Navajo, like uh, the sky and the sun in one. Well, that's Rex Lee Jim, Navajo poet. The sun, yeah, the the sun and the earth in one breath which uh, makes for darkness. No, that's, that not, I want to tell you, that's not a line of a poem, though, Bob. That is a whole poem in four, those four words. And that's, uh, you know, Rexley Jim is, uh, is the vice president of the tribal council, so he's one of those poets who manages to cross over into politics, like uh, Leopold Senghor. You know who founded Senegal, you know, and others. So, um, if there's, uh, are there other questions or comments? You know, oh uh, uh, yes. yes. I have a general question for you. You mentioned uh, the properties of spoken, like oral tradition, compared to writing is a little different. Writing was seen as something that was bad, since uh, it could lead to misinterpretations, whereas oral tradition is not. Do you think that's related with the medium or the fact that in the oral tradition, most of the time, before digital at least, we had the person who spoke the words as, as present so they could defend their words or prevent any misunderstanding? Well, you're, you're, you got that knowledge. one right. But I think it's basically the, the attitude in any change of consciousness. And uh, you know, you, when you change from orality to writing, you gain things, like for example, science. You know, you can't have science unless you can write down the results of your experiments and, quote, prove things. You know, on the other hand, when you change from, from writing, to, uh, from, uh, from, from orality to, to uh, writing, you also gain colonialism. You know, so there's, um, what I'm saying is there, uh, to me, it's not progress. We have three consciousnesses. Each of them has its, 
has, has great, great value. Problem is that as we gain these new consciousnesses, we forget the values of the old one in our rush to have this new way of thinking and being. And if I can say I've jumped out of the Trump and into the uh, Orban, you know, it's, I think, a lot because of the way that fake news and the use of, of, you know, of the downside <clears throat> of, the di of the digital consciousness allows for this kind of fascism to rise. You know, and we're, we here have the power, know the powers of orality and can speak the truth and are here to answer to each other. How do we, you know, what do we do to get that, uh, to be able to speak that truth to the power that's out there from our wonderful community sitting in this room here today? So I think there's something inherent about orality that you're talking about. But I think it's the shift of consciousness. And there's only been three in 50,000 years. So come on, you know. So we don't really know how to do this. But boy, let's admit we don't know how to do it and get to work. Peter. Yes, thank you. So I, I wonder how does oral communication and written communication relates to self-reflection. Because one can, it, it seems it could cut both ways. So it could go like, if our thoughts are also written down, it may help reflection, although in the digital age, it may be so quick to yeah. put it down that there is not much space and time for reflection, perhaps. Uh. But at the same time, it can also be that without writing it down, we have more freedom. We, 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 are, we are kind of united with the idea because we don't separate it from us. Franz Kafka had this with the saying that if we want to forget something, we do, we take a photograph. Uh -huh. so, sure. so, I got a ticket the other day at a coat check and the thing that the, 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 the person behind the counter said is, take a, a picture of your ticket. You know, I mean, why don't they just download the number under my phone? I don't know. Where's the app? But take a picture of the ticket, then you can lose the ticket. You've got the photo, right? But this is a wonderful question. Can we have applause, please, for Peter's great question? Um, I want to take you to a place where writing has just been invented, and you go to the library where they have the collection of the books, right, that have all been handwritten by monks in the illuminated letters, and there they are. You go in there, the library is the noisiest place in town because the few people who can read are reading aloud because they haven't invented reading to yourself yet. That kind of meditation, right? Why would you start off reading to, you know, like if you're reading and the, your servants are scurrying about, you read aloud, it's the movie of the week when you read aloud in the castle, you know? Um, reading to yourself took hundreds of years to evolve. That beautiful space that we all love about reading, where it's a sensational, it's a, the mind evolved into having that space. So all I know is that I meditate every day, I, you know, and I do it with an app. So here, here, here we go. You know, and somebody else here, Tomas. You got the answer. Um, good. Yes, ma'am. You know, languages. It's a natural thing for a language to be born or to be synthesized and be born and then to grow and m mutate. English is the greatest plastic language, the greatest mutating language there is. That's the survival of the English, you know, um, and then to die, you know. Um, the problem is that we've never had so many languages, and we know this because linguists can date languages as accurate as carbon dating. They know because of the way that sounds emerge and change and decay, they can tell when languages met 
and what happened? So, but never have we had the crisis like we're having right now. So this is a problem. There is a language in Australia, there's a language called Walpuri, and the young people there are now speaking a mix of English and Walpuri and their own slang that has developed its own kind of grammar and really is now being studied as a language. They call it, oh God, they call it light Walpuri. What can I tell you? You know, it's a diet a language. There are you know, a couple of hundred speakers, you know, probably more, you know. Um, they're developing their own app. They have, they, they uh, text and tweet in their, in light Walpuri. But the language, you know, it's very hard to know where a, uh, you know, to find languages, you know, because you don't, linguists are on the, on the alert, but they don't, do it. but you're absolutely right. Problem is, that so many languages are dying. So many, you know, a language is a consciousness in itself. It's a whole way of thinking. And if you lose that way of thinking, you learn a possible way of dealing with climate change. You know, these people, that language knows that land. They know the plants there. The cure for cancer is in a language somewhere, if we could, if we could understand it, you know. The, there's a, a, I did a show for PBS called Language Matters, and uh, I can, g I'll give anybody who wants to a link, I have a few DVD copies here. Um, it starts off in Australia with uh, the last speaker of Amardak, you know, Charlie Mongolda. Um, and, uh, you know, Charlie lives on Goulburn Island, where a f a 400 people speak uh, 15 different languages, and he speaks seven of them. So th losing that language to him is not necessarily the end of the world, although it is the end of a world, you know. Yes, there's, uh, there is, a, it's, and there's no greater way of talking about the human dimension of what a loss of language is than to talk of a person, uh, talk with a person whose whole lineage goes back in this language, and then it vanishes. Some parts of his language, of Amardak, though, will be sung by other songmen, and songmen and songwomen in Australia are like the poets of the Aboriginal languages. But he, the, some of, he, of the songs from his language are, going, are being picked up by people who speak in, in Maun and other languages on, on this island and other place, parts of, and they are used in their spirit poems, spirit songs, contain parts of languages that have disappeared. Amardak is not, when you lose it, you're not only losing the system I'm talking about of consciousness, but you know, it's very, very difficult to talk about how one language is a consciousness and different from any other because you can translate anything into any other language. Now, we all know those special words that each language has that can't be translated, but you can tell somebody an approximation of what it means. So in a way, you can translate to any language. And that's why people say, why don't we all speak the same language? You know, how much easier it would be. I'm, there's nothing wrong with being bilingual, multilingual. That's really what I'm talking about. But to lose a language is to lose those essences. And there's an essence in Amardak that really points to what I'm talking about. And that is, in Amardak, there's no left and right. So when you're speaking Amardak, you'd say, Charlie, we're trying to get this shot of you. Could you move your foot a little more to the southwest? You know? In other words, in Amardak, you're the self is never the center of your placement. You're always placed according to the cardinal points of the compass. And that's a consciousness that I think sends a few shivers, you know, to think about what that would be to not have a left or, or a right, just to always know which way it is to the bar or whatever. I don't know what it is, you know. Other places, of course, don't have even uh, the cardinal points. They, th they talk about the mountain direction and the ocean direction, right? Wherever you are, you place yourself in Hawaii. You know, you place yourself there. Hawaii, by the way, has only 15 
sounds in it. Um, the click language that we heard in here, Ngu, is, uh, has 126 phonemes. And there is a theory that languages, humans are lazy, that's not a theory, there's a, a, a that you can judge, a, you can date a language, you have a, know how old it is by how many phonemes it has. Hawaiian is one of our, the youngest languages that we have. Eight consonants, five verbs, and the okina, which means a glottal stop, like when you say, uh-oh, that little sound in the middle, that's a, that is a written sound in Hawaiian. Hawaiian was, uh, became a, uh, an official language in 1976, and it's one of only two states in the United States that have official languages other than English. Why is English necessary to be an official language? It's not, of course. Everything is in English. The only reason it's official is, as you can say, other languages aren't official, you know? Alaska voted to have English its official language in 2004. It's a red state. It wasn't until 2014 that 19 indigenous Alaskan languages were uh, voted to also be official languages. So the two newest states in the U.S. have languages of official along with English. One of the languages in Alaska is EAC, which by the time it got made official, nobody spoke anymore. But it's official. Yes, Bailey. I love sign language. Don't you love sign? I mean, like, you know, you know, the thing about sign language is hearing people think of sign languages as a translation of a spoken language. But of course it's not. It's a complete language that is created by people who cannot hear. There's a way in which the essence of orality, which orality to me in this case means you can't write it down, okay? What could be more the essence of orality than sign language? You know, you saw the little symbols of, of signs, but so different from Peter Cook translating what it means to be smelling love in the air, you know? Um, when something happens in the future, we're talking about something in the future in sign, it's out here in front of you. When it's in the past, it's behind you. What you're talking about right now, it's here. When you talk about father, you have the symbol for father, which then becomes a pronoun which you place somewhere. So then you refer to that place. So you don't always use the sign for father. You can just say him over here, right? Every part of speech, every tense, everything you think about in, in, in spoken language is replicated in sign, but is replicated in space. Yeah. And of course, the community that speaks sign, you know, that uses sign, is, uh, is an extraordinary community. It's the only language that is currently threatened by science. The cochlear implants uh, work for many deaf people. They can now hear. So think about the parents, all right? The deaf parents of a deaf child who, have to, who are dealing with the situation of the survival of their community versus the mainstreaming of their child with a cochlear implant, which may or may not work. I, all I know is that ASL, American Sign Language, is some of the greatest slams in the United States of America, folks. A deaf poetry slam, believe me, is someplace where you want to be. Mark Smith is the cause of that, so blame him. <laughs> yeah, sign. Well, we can keep this going all night, but I think that uh, we should let the rest of the night roll here. Uh, but, oh, one, one more thing, which is that the Bowery Poetry Club, you know, where I work, um, now has started an, is a, an app called Slam Find. And it wants to be a home for all poetry videos. You want to find them, and we're working especially with American Sign Language right now. But if you want to find poetry, if you want a home for your 
uh, for your videos in this kind of context. Talk to me. I got lots of little cards from Mason Granger. Mason Granger, who invented it. So uh, just going to be, it's another way to get uh, poetry in the digital realm out to, uh, out to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kati, for having me here. And everybody. Hannah Lord, thank you.